was born in Teto Christopher Chemese, but I'm better known as the village shrink. Maybe that's because I grew up in the villages of the Eastern Cape, in Mount Coke, in a place called Kuku, where my grandmother, Mam Nosini, who just turned 98 on the 17th of November, taught us what it meant to be a villager. I'm sure you've heard a lot of people talking about it takes a village to raise a child. One of the things that has uh, kept me awake most of my career, over 10 years of being a psychologist, what happens when a village is a, a, village is a traumatized village? What children does the village give birth to? Um, growing up in the villages, one of the things that was obvious to me was that the villagers, especially the elders, had more control of what we as the children in the village would do. For an example, I got more hidings from elders in the village than I, I got hidings in my own family. Partly because I used to question the rules of the village and I had to learn early on that you don't question the rules. I suppose that's why when I had to go to university in 1995, just after our democratic dispensation, I ended up majoring in politics and psychology. With the benefit of hindsight, I suppose the village elders giving me hidings was more about them trying to control this energetic, creative, inquisitive mind. Perhaps they didn't have Ritalin. It's not very often that psychologists reach out to people. Our profession is a very elitist profession. It's been commodified. And when you think about South Africa, one has to wonder, given the trauma that we have suffered as a country, how do we as psychologists help in making sure that the psyche of the nation is actually healed? You know, there is a patient that keeps me awake every day. And when I say every day, I mean every day. This patient is 22 years old and comes from a family of five, lives with the mother and the father, is the firstborn of three siblings. A sister was 15 years old and a brother was 10 years old. And the patient at the time of me realizing that I was worried about this patient, had been having recurring dreams in which the father is chasing her with a gun. The father is a police. He's a former activist during apartheid era. And the mother is a school principal. And the trigger for the patient to come and see me was because the sister, who's 15 years old, had been raped by a teacher who works with the mother at the same school where she's a principal. While she's a principal, she's helpless in dealing with the rape. And when the family wanted to deal with the rape, the father said, no, we shall not report this because it's going to tarnish the good name of the family. At the same time of my patient coming to see me, her brother had in fact been struggling at school. He had isolated himself. He had started bad wetting, and his grades had actually deteriorated. Interestingly and curiously, the sister who had been raped was removed from the school to another school where she was the top of her class. While this is largely my creative imagination, in fact, this is what is typical in South Africa. In fact, what if this patient I'm talking about is South Africa? After all, in this very beautiful country of ours, we have had situations where somebody who reported rape had to lose her identity and only got to know, we only got to know what her name was when she passed on. She had to be shifted away from the country. So this country of ours has some unfinished business because in any case, our job as psychologists is to deal with uncomfortable, unfinished business. 
In 1924, you may not know this, but a brilliant psychology student received his doctorate in psychology. And his thesis, his topic was the planting of the emotions. He was later to become the Minister of Native Affairs. He was later to become one of the key architects of what we know as apartheid. So apartheid was designed with the help of psychologists. You would think, well, psychologists are meant to be healing people. But we have seen in the United States last year that psychologists have actually been involved in torture of political prisoners working with the CIA. So our profession is not as obvious in the healing of the psyches as one would make us believe. You know, going and studying and thinking about Fervut and what he did, he did a brilliant job, by the way. If you think about the symptoms of South Africa, if we were to think of South Africa as this 22-year-old patient, we have seen communities that burn schools because they want, a, they want a clinic. We have seen a situation where police, like in my imaginary family that I've just told you about, where police who were shot in 1976 as teenagers, and now in the police force, shooting students at, when they protest for free and equal education, equal access to education. Now, this bothers me because, on the one hand, comfortably in my practice in Bryanston, I see individuals, groups, and, 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 and families, and I've been wondering if Fervood had a system that was legal, that was a government system. What have we done to undo the unfinished business of the traumatized psyche? And I'm convinced that we haven't done a very good job. I'm the first one to lift my hand and say, well, even as a psychologist, I'm guilty as charged because our service is commodified. Only those who can afford them can actually come and access our services. But it's not all doom and gloom because the very same country struggled to deal with HIV until we had what we call the National Strategic Plan, which is a five-year plan that the country has so that everyone who works on HIV can, in fact, contribute in making sure that we deal with HIV, TB, and STIs. We know it was not a pleasant history that we, it's not a pleasant history that we have in how we dealt with HIV at some point in our lives. I'm convinced that if we were to listen to the words of Brenda Farsi, who had a song in her troubled spirit that said, Umuntu, Umuntu, Ngabandu, perhaps she knew that at some point we will forget our humanity because we have RTP houses to build, we have infrastructure to build, we have to focus on technological advancement. Well, Brenda Farsi left us, and Tandi Somazwai took the baton and reminded and asked us, actually, and told us that you have forgotten who has given birth to you. The villagers like Nelson Mandela, like Walter Sisulu, like Lillian Goyi, who sacrificed their careers because they believed in the humanity of South Africa. 1994 came and promised us a better life for all, but every politician in this country, they will tell you we have inequality, we have poverty, and we have unemployment. What politicians don't tell you is that, in fact, we have human beings who have been promised a better life for all, but we have become the most violent country because people are just hopeless. No wonder you have young people in Deben, they smoke what they call wunga. In the Western Cape, they smoke what they call tick. In Gauteng, they smoke what they call nyaope. That's self-medication, I argue. What is to be done if we are to heal this country? Well, we have to first acknowledge that we have a problem. And our problem may not only be about infrastructure development, technological advancement. It may well be about dealing with the psychological trauma we all have suffered particularly the black majority 
who continue to be in the margins of society. And how could we do this when, in fact, we don't have enough psychologists? Well, we could do it because villagers like Nelson Mandela, Oliver Tambo, have taught us that there is abundance of human spirit in this country, where Steve Biko even told us that, in fact, while the world might give, might give us technology, what we are going to get from Africa is the spirit of human relations. But what are the human relations currently in South Africa as a 22-year-old patient, if you will? We have seen penny sparrows calling black people monkeys in this country and sharing that publicly. We have seen videos of people beating a white man, beating black people, and taking a video of that. We have seen recently a video of a black man being put in a coffin while alive. And the guys took pictures of this. They are circulating in our social media. Thankfully, the technology allows for us to see these things because that's what we don't want to deal with. That's the unfinished business of this country. I get shocked by South Africans who get shocked <laughs> that these things are happening. If you had brilliant psychologists in 1924 who designed apartheid, they knew that blacks have to be functional inferiors and whites have to be functional superiors. So these guys are just being themselves. That's the trauma that they have inherited. So, what's the point? Why get shocked? Uh, government officials would say, well, that's shocking because that is not what our world-renowned uh, constitution says we are. Yes, we have a world-class constitution to the extent that we don't deal with the psyche of this nation. I argue that we're going to continue seeing more and more of these incidents because primarily our responsibility is to acknowledge we have unfinished business of healing the psyche of this country. And perhaps that's what many countries do. They focus on infrastructure development. If you think in Rwanda, as an example, 22 years later, people who were involved in the genocide in Rwanda are being arrested. In this country, one of the key players in terms of apartheid, he's a Nobel Peace Prize winner. There's never been a collective responsibility in so far as apartheid is concerned. In the very same country, when we were in, on the brink of killing each other, which led to many people say, oh, we are a miracle country. Well, there is no miracle in being denialist. When Chris Annie was assassinated in 1993, we were reminded of the possibility and the hope of what could become. But Chris Annie's killers, both are out of jail, one is dead, and we still don't know who gave the order. That's the unfinished business. If we do not deal with the unfinished business, we will have to deal with the consequences of our kids inheriting their trauma from us and perpetuating the trauma. Three weeks ago, my nephew, Naledi, he's seven years old, he came from school and asked me a very pointed question. Uncle, are white people famous? I asked him, why do you ask? He says, well, at school, all the teachers are white. That is the unfinished business, ladies and gentlemen. If we do not deal with the psyche of this country, it's not going to take psychologists only. It's going to take everyone playing their role, challenging sexism, challenging homophobia, challenging racism in our private spaces. You can't legislate that kind of violence. We have to deal with South Africa's unfinished business, or else Naledi's children will be asking Naledi 22 years from now, are white people famous? Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much.